Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Small is Bountiful World Oceans Day celebration. Um, happy World Oceans Day to start with. My name is Ratana Chinfakti, and I am just, uh, you know, introducing today the session, which is focusing on African small-scale fisheries in the time of COVID-19, voices from the continent. Um, many of you were with us during that last week webinar, and you may have heard already uh, that we covered uh, various situations about COVID-19, how it affects small-scale fisheries around the world. In this particular session, we are bringing you the voices from the continent, and it is truly a great pleasure for me to introduce the chair and moderator of this session today. This is uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Mani Baisak. This session is organized uh, with PLAS, uh, uh, which is an institution that um, Muniba is, is situated it with the support from our other, other organizations, including to two big to ignore partnership that I am a part of. So Muniba, welcome to the studio and thank you very much for organizing this very exciting uh, session. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of people who are interested in learning about how how things are in the continent and more importantly, what 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 is the plan going forward because there is life after COVID-19 as well. So thank you so much for doing this, Mudiba. Good morning, everybody. If you're in um, on the continent and uh, good evening, if you are um, in the in the um, in Canada or in the United States. So um, I'm also very excited to have this, um, to moderate the session. It's on African small scale fisheries in the time of COVID. And we're going to have voices from the continent. Um, so myself, um, not too long ago, um, at the end of April, we hosted a PLAS uh, seminar, which is the Poverty, um, the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of Western Cape. And we looked at um, the relationship, the impact of COVID-19 and small-scale fisheries. So we will get some clips on, on, on that in the program. And uh, please bear with us. We, we're doing this for the first time, the live broadcasting with the clips. So there might be technical glitches um, in between. Um, and then we also joined by two powerful women on the continent. Um, the first one is my colleague, um, Eddie Trudeth. Eddie Trudeth um, Lunganga, and she is the executive director of um, IMIDO. And IMIDO is um, Environmental Management and Economic Development Organization. I know Eddie Trudeth for a long time. Eddie Trudeth is a known um, activist and, um, and promotion of small-scale fisheries in East Africa. She's also a gender activist. But she's also a, a the general secretary, the executive director, general secretary of, um, of uh, Are We Fish Net, founded in 27. She's um, she's also um, which is a, an IMEDO, which is a nonprofit organization committed to small scale fisheries and fish workers in Tanzania. Edith Trudeth is passionate about women and uh, fisheries and believes that women's rights, gender equality and women's empowerment are important pillars of fisheries governance and resource management. Also key um, for the topic that we are talking. I would like to know both from your, from your insights, Edith Trudeth, as to how gender plays out in, in, in fisheries. She's actively engaged in the process of establishing a Tanzanian Women Fish Workers Association. Um, and I, I, I don't doubt for a minute that it would be a success. The next person I'm introducing is um, my colleague uh, from Nigeria, Kafayat Fakoya. And um, she holds a position as a senior lecturer at the Department of Lagos State University in Nigeria. She's the executive secretary of gender and aquaculture fisheries section in the Asian Fisheries Society. So all of those emails that you get is this is the the one, the face behind the one of all the emails we get on gender and, and fisheries. 
Her work includes social and ecological issues affecting small-scale fisheries and aquaculture. Dr. Fakoya is, is a researcher and a national gender um, advisor in the Illuminating Hidden Harvest um, a project uh, that she was a part of um, for Nigeria. She participated in the validation workshop of agriculture and fisheries and also uh, dealing with um, uh, the Committee on um, uh, Food Security, Voluntary Guidelines, Nutrition is all part of, of, of them. So, so welcome um, um, my colleagues from the continent and I'm going to ask um, each one of you just to give your first introductions around what are the key issues in your area around uh, COVID and how it impacts small-scale fisheries. I also want you to specifically focus in on gender. Thank you. Eddie Trudeth? Unmute your mic, please. Or what have I just done? Um, did I just delete? Okay, Kafayat, my, my apologies. Can you start? Can you unmute your mic and 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 start, please? Um, Edith Trudeth will will join us again. Somehow I may may have just uh, um, deleted her from the session. Okay, please start. Uh, good morning, everyone in, in African continent. Um, um, the three the main issues with uh, small scale fisheries in Nigeria are that, um, uh, first of all, the social and economic contribution of the small scale fisheries are undervalued in national economy. And this is also from the global perspective. So, uh, when there's poor valuation of the small scale fisheries, definitely you won't get the right estimate rights estimates for the contributions in the national gross domestic product. And this is also a cause for the low prioritization of the sector in the national economy, and, and also among uh, in the midst of the agricultural sector. Now, in the midst of the uh, COVID-19, uh, the small scale fisheries are vulnerable, and the vulnerability has also intensified, simply because um, they, they lack what you call um, organizational capabilities uh, in Nigeria. Um, as such, their, their roles, their, the fish organizations have not been able to do much to rally around the members to help them. And the government, though, has um, uh, initiated some palliatives. It, has, it hasn't actually gone around all uh, the small scale fishers. They are not really um, beneficiaries of the palliatives. And um, another reason is because um, We've had the problem of um, the lack of uh, co-governance policy in Nigeria, and this doesn't actually uh, make the small scale fisher to be inclusive of a governor. So um, for a long time, they've been excluded from participation in uh, decision making, and more or less, the women have been excluded even at the local levels from decision making, you know, at the grassroots level community. So um, overall, uh, the COVID-19 has had differential impacts because uh, Nigeria is a, uh, a country with 36 states and the federal capital territory. And um, the lockdown was, um, uh, the total lockdown about three of the states. And those uh, in those states, uh, they felt the lockdown measures more after the, pand uh, in the pandemic. And as a result, it actually affected the distribution of the fish, of the fish uh, supply chain. There was, it's called disruption in the fish supply chain uh, the fishers initially were able to uh, you know, harvest so many fish, but then they had to reduce their trips because there weren't uh, there weren't so many people buying fish from them, and um, also a lot of people really didn't have the cash. There was um, most people, uh, more people were cash trapped than having uh, liquidity 
So uh, they couldn't really buy so many up at the, from the fishers at the same time. Now the women who are more or less into fish trading and processing are mostly affected as fish vendors. They couldn't go out to vend because of the lockdown. Um, and uh, the women fishmongers, you know, couldn't actually make so much profit any longer because the, uh, the, uh, the fishing expedition they financed were not going as of before. And um, the traders as, as well were also, you know, were also uh, jolted by the lockdown. Uh, simply because um, it affected traders from the metropolitan areas more. They bought fish at higher rates within the metropolis because we have some landing sites, fish landing sites in the metropolis, and these are very much in the urban areas. So the implication is that they bought fish at a higher cost, and of course they couldn't really buy as much as they wanted because they couldn't go to interlands to the rural fishing communities actually to buy fish because of the lockdown measures. Although the government now came uh, came on to add uh, food items as essential duties, you know, that um, the movement of food items shouldn't be uh, disrupted. But then the, the women still faced um, some, some sort of harassment from the enforcement agency. They had, and then the social distancing also emphasized, also added to the cost of moving the fish from the point of uh, landings to where they buy the, buy the fish to their locations. So overall, it caused uh, spikes in the uh, cost of fish um, for fish that were, and it's even added more to the cost of fish that were not really in season because we have seasonality in the uh, and abundance of fish. Not all fish are found all year round. Some are found uh, found more in the rainy season. For instance, we have the crayfish from Akwai Bom State, uh, which is a delicacy. And then the, it, uh, before the COVID-19 period, uh, there was a shortage in the supply of crayfish because it wasn't it was the off period. So when the uh, mm -hmm. pandemic came, the, the, this caused a higher increases in the price of the crayfish from Aquaibum. And also it's the same went for, uh, went for other fish like the silver catfish. It also caused um, uh, increases in, in the fish prices. So um, overall, I think the women you know, are more impacted because the women are these pillars of the uh, fishing households in most uh, in, in most countries, in, in, develop, in most developed countries, and uh, they bear that triple burden of having to take care of the home as caregivers, um, mm -hmm. and then they also have to do something economically. You know, they process the fish, they sell the fish, and then they have so much burden on them. And then now with the COVID nineteen, it means that the, the burden has increased, both in, within the household as caregivers, the children are at home, they have to tend more spend more time with the children to teach the children because uh, mm -hmm. schools are not in session and uh, and then they, of course um they they worry more about how the family will feed so um it's the body falls more on them to ensure that there's sustainable food supply within the household um so, thank you uh, uh Kafayat. um we'll we'll come back to you in terms of that was very interesting i also find quite a lot of what you said happening in south africa around around the the extra burden and responsibility that has been give, put on women not only to find money for food but also to find money for um uh for uh for uh, the, the family in terms of continued livelihoods, but more importantly, the the extra burden of also schooling uh, the children. So, so, so it it's 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 a similar case in South Africa as you will see. Um, and um, I think Ratana, it may be after Eddie Trudet speak. Maybe if we could go um, directly to Rowena's inputs around gender, so that we really go into the gender issues and how that. Uh, plays out in South Africa, I think it would be good. So, Eddie Trudeth, welcome back. Um, I hope, um, I thought I deleted you, but you, it's, it's your internet. Yeah, welcome, Eddie Trudeth. Thank you. Um, so, so the question, did you hear the question I asked around um, the impact of COVID in your area, but also more specifically, if you can hone in on what, how does this particular impact on, on women? Thank you. Thank you again, Muneba. And I'm sorry for what happened. Uh, good morning. And 
Good evening and maybe good afternoon, everybody, depending on your uh, time zone. I'm really happy to be part of this conversation. And um, I would like to start by giving a little bit of perspective about fisheries in Tanzania, because fisheries is among the priority sectors in the national strategy for growth and um, reduction of poverty in, in my country. And this is in, in recognition of the role that fisheries play in the national socioeconomic development. And it provides a lot of you know, economic benefits. It provides employment, income, uh, recreation, trade, etc., etc. So in Tanzania, almost more than 90% of fisheries is small scale. And the landings contributed by small scale fisheries is about 98%, which is estimated to be uh, like 400,000 tons per annum. So this is very significant. And um, coming now to uh, the impact, how small scale fixtures are impacted by COVID-19 in my country, I think you might have heard that the response to COVID-19 in my country has been different from so many other countries. We didn't have any uh, total lockdown in here, but rather people, I mean, activities have been going on as usual. And a lot of awareness has been done uh, by the government uh, in collaboration with the civil society organizations and the fisher uh, organizations themselves. But though still uh, a lot of more uh, awareness and sensitization uh, needs to be done. So based on the mode of operation of the small scale fisheries in Tanzania, for fishermen or fishers to go out fishing, it needs um, a group of between three to six people to go in, in, in a fishing boat. And this itself already is placing them in a risk of, you know, uh, to, to, to the pandemic. And therefore, this puts them at a higher risk, but also even how the fish is auctioned, it brings many people at the same time together. And again, this is putting them at, at a big risk. So these awarenesses and practices of hand washing and wearing masks and not staying in, in, in gatherings for a long time is what has been uh, helpful. And also in Tanzania, we've been um, emphasizing so much into um, healthy diets, eating a lot of vitamin C and um, you know, steaming the people, I mean, steaming themselves using the herbs. So I think it also helped because it has been the norm now in the country. So how has it impacted uh, in terms of um, fish supply, uh, in terms of marketing, in terms of access to the resources itself? Um, it has affected people in different ways. For the fishers, most of the fish uh, that is caught is uh, traded domestically and for the domestic market. And some of the fish also is sent to the uh, fish processing factories. For example, the Nile patch in Lake Victoria. Um, we have fish processing factories that once the fish is processed, is, export, uh, is, is being exported to the external market. So because of the closures in the international market, it has affected the business here in the country. And what does that mean then? The factories have a lot of frozen fish in their stores, and therefore they are no longer receiving fish from the small scale fishers. And this means that the small scale fishers have lost their market. And this is a challenge, but at the same time, it's an opportunity because they have opened up more on the local or domestic market. So this one is closing and the other one has been opening up. Now, coming to the women, women have been impacted uh, um, massively uh, this is because mostly women um, are key players in the short supply chains. And I, I would give you an, a, a, an, a practical example from where I come from. I live in the shores of Lake Victoria. I work with women fish processors and traders from within the Lake Victoria here. And the conversation we've been having as to how and to what extent have they been affected uh, by the COVID-19. I would like to give this example of Mama Anna Mtui. 
Anam Tui manages a small restaurant, which is located near a university here. We have a St. Augustine University. She also purchases fish from the fishers, uh, the silver fish, the small pelagic we call here daga. After processing, she sells to the nearby communities, but also to the university students and to her restaurant. And at the same time, she supplies fish to the region, nearby regions like Dar es Salaam and other regions near, near Mwanza. So COVID-19 has impacted her in a way that the, the universities, the nearby secondary schools, and all other restaurants where she supplies fish have been closed. And she no longer has market for her products. And at the same time, she has a loan from the bank. So it has been very difficult for her to continue managing because the restaurant has been closed. The market where she supplies fish has been closed because there are no more students, no more um, um, university students and secondary school students. And even in the regions where she has been supplying, it's the same thing because the schools have been closed. So almost the business kind of was interrupted and almost stopped. So she has been grappling with how is she going to, uh, to, to, to manage her loan and the bank has been reminding her every now and then. So this situation of Mama Anna is just one case of a lot of many other you know, situations and women facing a similar thing. And adding to what uh, Kafayat has said, this has gotten a lot of implications because whatever a woman gets out of this business is for the family. And therefore you would realize already um, the money that is gotten to, to support the family for food, health, education is no longer there. And therefore the whole family is facing this um, uh, uh, challenge. But also when it comes to nutrition, these short supply chains are key. They play a very significant role in ensuring that families, the poor families have access to nutritious food. Small fish. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Eddie Trudeth. We're going to get yeah. into that. What I want to keep the thread now is that we're going to come back on the markets and the short value chain. So, so, okay. so apologies to 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 um to cut in there. I think that it is um also important to kind of see um that that they are definitely gendered perspectives around COVID-19 um, on the continent. But also what what we also need to realize is that the 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 issues that was pre-COVID is just escalated during COVID. And I think when it comes to gender, that's even more so because more responsibilities has been added uh, on onto women. So I'm going to ask um um, my technical moderator, uh, uh, Ratana, to help me with playing a video. And this video is about Rowena Iruapa. She is a, a fisherwoman and organizer in um, South Africa. Um, uh, I think let's, let's just play that. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ratana, we can't hear the sound. Uh, uh, we don't seem to hear any sound of Rowena's voice. Um, I think if you unmute your um, your voice, then 
your screen, then it would work. Yeah. Everything needs to be unmuted on your side. Sorry, in order for me to be unmuted, I have to show up. <laughs> so let's try. Yeah, I can hear it now. Uh, I think let's just continue with the clip. Um, I will trans. There's a translation afterwards. Um,
opleiding te gee, om vir ons, om vir ons rechter te jaap, om ons so goed te brammel, en te verkom, om en te verkom, om een goeie inkomst te gaan leren. Op die oomblik is ek een IR, is er vrou, en ek is bekommerd, ek is ook die verteenwoordiger, en ek is bekommerd oor, oor die IR permitte, want die IR permitte, is waar van ons mense leef, en op die oomblik, die regelaties laat ons, het ons nie toegelaat, of laat ons nie toe, om ons permitte, om ons kreef te gaan vang, en ons goed in een goeie, om een goeie prijs te krijg, om ons kreef te bekomen, want die export is een probleem, die marketing is een probleem, en jy sien geen van die bemaakers, die baies, wat nou om ons te jaap nie, so, ons is gestak, ons is, daar is geen ander inkomst nie, ons mag nou seer toe gaan, maar die prijs, want ons kan nie uit export nie, so met ander woorde, die prijs is so laag, wat ons doen, ons in aandacht transfer van die area af, wat ons ons met voer as transport, ek meen, elke dag is die kinders nou by die huis gewees, en weet jy wat, het sier is dit, wanneer die kind by ons klein, mama, is daar nie iets om te eet nie, en jy is af te bang om te antwoord, want daar is nie een snekje brood nie, of die brood wat daar is, is vir die, is vir die aan, jy moet het so wees, vir die aan, so ek vraag asjeblief vir, 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 vir die minister, om ons as vrouwe rechter te jaal, in die kleinstaal, ek voel so dat, dat ek as een verteenwoordige van my gemeenskap, ek as een vrou, wat soveel verantwoordigheid het, ek as een vrou, wat my huis moet bestuur, Ek is een vrou wat voorbereiding moet tref vir my families, vir my kinders, vir my gesin. Ek vraag, ek heb een versoek, asjeblief, om ons te jaag. En die bedrijf met ons rechte wat ons het. Ek glo daar aan dat die vrou met haar kennen krijg, vir dit wat hulle doen, in die saam, in ons liefens bestaan, die wereld, en ons gesinne moet ons respecteer, die gemeenskap van moet ons respecteer. Ek sal bloed die vrou en recht daarvan, en hulle doen baie meer werk, as wat hulle betaal word voor. En daarom, vir my dag, wat ek graag het, het die minister met hier die live show stream van ons sien, so wat sy kan weet waar hier ons gaan, en hier die COVID-19, en ook, het ons baie bekom, het is vir die toekomst, in die visbedrijf. Baie dankie, Rowena. Baie dankie vir wat jy nou gesê het. Ok, thank you. Just to trans... Ok, I think that it is important that we play the translation, Ratana. What Rowena said, she mentioned that there are basically eight points that she mentioned in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on women. She calls it a double threat. It is not just the lockdown that impacts them, but also for women being being part of the household, the fact that women not only are responsible for food, but also also have to be responsible for teaching and, and educating children now. So extra burdens have been placed on women. She particularly mentioned the, the, the significant role women plays in the pre-harvest section in terms of preparing men to go fish, but also in terms of the post-harvest section, how women are, are, are in terms of, of of, of cleaning fish and and activities but more more so women have not just tucked in their community and other communities on on the fish itself they also want to kind of do and uh, figs um, of the land they use the cow they use um, uh, jewelry that they're making, uh, they use uh, different activities that they are struggling in terms of currently that they used to have the market and currently they don't have the market. So that also adds to the limit of the income. She uh, um, She's also part of um, a woman, she's a woman leader of Coastal Links, a community-based organization, and she speaks about the women in, in KZN, their challenges in terms of harvesting mussels in in the intertidal zone and in in the intertidal zone they they um uh they risk uh fisheries inspectors and officials taking over taking confiscating the catch and also risk being uh, arrested um 
Uh, she then moved over to the issue of social grants and the dependency of um, families of many in the community that are dependent on the social and the welfare grants. The welfare grants are not uh, sufficient, but it is an important part of, of, of how um, uh, uh, that support people and also their livelihoods. Uh, um, uh, uh, and she, she mentioned in terms of food parcels, yes, People, food parcels are distributed in the community, but not everyone uh, gets those food parcels. Uh, related to the to the grant system, it's also saying that not everybody benefits from the grant system. So the need for food, the need for the grant system, is uh, to be to be expanded in terms of is is important. She she also talked about. Um, the, the challenges in in currently in buying in buying fish um, and and um, and in terms of of the market so um, a key part is the West Coast rock lobster she is an interim relief permit holder and because of the Chinese um, uh, New Year and lockdown and COVID, no, uh, there's a there's a complete ban on export. That means a complete ban on exporting West Coast rock lobster to China, uh, um, risking livelihoods of many small scale fishers. The market agents that are are normally around um, them this time of the year when uh, selling all the time. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ratana, uh, for playing that. So it worked well. So I think what we're going to do now, we're going to go into the comment section, and I'm going to uh, lift a comment, um, and I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues to to kind of give um, feedback onto onto that comment. So this is a comment from um, Ruyo Mia. How are governments responding to the pandemic for small-scale fisheries? Is government providing any support for small-scale fisheries, in particularly during COVID-19? I can um, respond from South African side, but I'm going to first give a caveat a response, um, and then Eddie Trudeth, and then I can also try to to chip in in terms of the South Africa. But I think that uh, Rowena Rowena uh, basically mentioned that there's no no money, there's no funding at this stage, but I will say what is in place. Um, Kafia, can you answer, respond to that question? Oh, well, yes, thank you. Uh, I would like to say that specific for small school fisheries, there, there, is, a, there is no government uh, allegiance for the sector. The, the government did um, uh, make uh, some palliatives generally for the people. And the small scale fishes are supposed to be part of the people. And so maybe perhaps some people are reluctant to drop some of the palliatives, which can be part in terms of uh, packages, but then uh, there are no specific or special you know, packages designed for the small scale fishes during the pandemic. Okay, so 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 there was no really funding or relief funding for small scale fisheries in, in your area. Mainly just for uh, uh, the, the specific for small scale fisheries, no, but there were um, some sort of um, funding that are meant for micro, uh, micro small scale enterprises. So these mm -hmm. were open for the informal sector. And of course, you know, the small scale fisheries are info, is part of the informal sector. So the problem is do the small scale fisheries have the ability to actually access such funds? So it's not specific to small scale fishery sector, but it is more open to the informal sector where you have micro and small <coughs> and medium enterprises. So that's just the only type of, uh, and then the palliative in form, in form of food packages were distributed um, in various states of the federation. So, but they were not as actually specific for small scale fisheries. So it's just a matter of, but uh, the, the palliative actually, the food package will actually go around. So, no, so I think I don't think I can say that specific small scale fisheries there were uh, responses, but then generally for the informal sector and for the general populace, there were sort of government interventions. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I also see a, a comment. I think it is somebody that is tuning in from um, 
uh, Nigeria saying a number of uh, uh, pala palliatives like loans cannot be assessed, accessed by small scale fisheries. What is then the way out for small scale fisheries? Um, I think we can park that for now, but we will try to to kind of wrap up with, with that, that particular question. Eddie Trudeth, what is the, um, uh, you say you didn't really have a, a hard lockdown or any lockdown regulations in Tanzania, but you mentioned that your, your government is saying that healthy eating, steaming your foods, no fried foods. Um, it reminds me similar to to what um, the first responses of um, our minister back when we had a crisis in HIV AIDS in South Africa said more beetroot garlic and you know will help the virus. So so I think that 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 was a um, a challenge. Anyway, try to answer the question um, in terms of what what the government responding to to the pandemic besides what what you should eat. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, again, yeah, there hasn't been a total lockdown in Tanzania and therefore, and also there hasn't been any like financial uh, support today, specifically uh, for small scale fisheries in Tanzania. But what has been done is for the general public also to raise the awareness and ask the public to observe the hygiene procedures, hand washing, uh, avoiding, um, you know, staying in groups, meaning the social distancing, wearing of masks and everything. And so in the, for example, in the marketplaces, like in Monza, we have this uh, big fish market uh, in, in the region, uh, mainly the hand washing facilities and asking everybody to keep washing their hands all the time and, only to maintain this uh, social distancing and mainly that those areas. But when it comes to funding specifically directed for small scale fisheries, there hasn't been something like that. Um, uh, thank you. Um, in the South African case, uh, uh, the clip that we showed you now is part of a, um, a webinar we had on the 30th of April that was hosted by PLAS, um, and you can still see the, the full, uh, the full uh, webinar on, on there. Uh, but um, we have had uh, uh, a hard lockdown where we're restricted uh, of, in terms of movement for the first three weeks, a little bit of relax in the following weeks. And now we are in stage three where, where, where children is just going back to school today. And Cape Town is the epicenter of the virus. Cape Town is the epicenter of, in terms of Africa. I think um, last night our cases of deaths is, 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 is nearing a thousand two away from a thousand and we are close to uh to fifty thousand um cases in terms of the COVID COVID nineteen. So so um stimulus packages has been released by the government, stimulus packages for, for companies, stimulus packages for agriculture, but no stimulus package for small scale fishers. And when you have a hard lockdown um and you uh, you restrict the movement of people in terms of accessing livelihoods and especially in the informal economy. You, you restrict the livelihoods, you restrict the casual income that people depend on livelihoods for food security, then it is a crisis. And, and often from throughout the lockdown, we hear the, the, the calls from people, what choice do I have? Do I die of hunger? or do I um, contract the virus? And a lot of people are saying, I will rather die, I would rather contract the virus than to die of hunger. So so there's, there's been a lot of challenges that the hard lockdown has maybe worked for middle class uh, people, but not for people who are in informal settlement and and in terms of um, in terms of depending on on movement um, to make income. So 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 I think it is a very delicate balance in terms of how governments respond to what the majority of the people's needs are and is the model of what is used in in Europe in terms of lockdown and in the US applicable to the model in in South Africa. I think that you know all of us buy 
by bought into the idea that we need to have a lockdown and we need to give government some space to kind of get the enough um, beds and, and hospitals prepared. But but it but it's been a challenge. Also, food parcels has been a key part of the of the package, um, and and I think that it is important that people are also saying that we also don't just want food parcels, don't make us subsistence we also want to have we want to buy our um we want to sell our fish and and then provide us with all the personal protective equipment uh needed okay so i'm going to um remove uh this question and see if there are any other uh, uh comments that we that we um can comment um okay so there's, there's, let's move to the issue of food security, which I, I, I see. I see there's another comment on uh, from Junaid Francis. I know him. He's a student at PLAS and also work for WWF. Um, he's also been part of the Too Big to Ignore training, uh, transdisciplinary training in South Africa. So Junaid asked, how has COVID-19 affected household food security in, fo uh, in fishing communities? Any truth you have... Um, um, start to touch touch on that, but but can we just have a, a round as to to what extent has this effect food security um, uh, in 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 fishing households? Um, South African cases definitely. I've just I've just tried to answer that question now. Um, uh, and also, uh, Kafia, just just um, your microphone is. Uh, let's test. Can you can you uh, respond to the food security? Of course, you said food parcel, so I I'm sure there has been a challenge on that front. Well, uh, yes, thank you. I hope you're in the better now. Uh, um, the food security is linked to the income, the daily from the fish of me, from the uh, business, from the fishing activities. Now, uh, initially, uh, at the onset of the lockdown, um, there was a surplus fish, and um, people bought fish, and they were made some money. But then, when the uh, lockdown progressed, um, the fishers reduced the number of trips because the patronage was low. There was no purchasing uh, power on the part of the, uh, the consumers. So, and that reduced the income of, of the fish uh, for the fishers and also for the fish traders. And as a result, they are not able to buy other food stock that they need. They don't feed, only feed on fish, but they also feed on other, you know, food stock, food ingredients, staple food. So, um, with the uh, when the uh, lockdown intensified, they couldn't really make up, uh, make ends meet with getting enough money to buy uh, food. It became more difficult for them, so they had to adjust their rations, the food rations. Um, in many of the fishing households. But now that the uh, lockdown uh, has been eased or relaxed, life is better resuming back for the fishers and also for the fish traders and the fish processors. They're able to sell a bit more and they're able to make their income. You know, if, apart from uh, the fishing business, most of the women are also in other occupations. Uh, but then all this was severely, severely affected during the lockdown because of the social distancing and the people have to stay at home. But I think the effects were much more felt within the metropolis, uh, where you have some uh, fish traders who often have to go out to the, to, to the rural areas to get the fish. You are more affected by the uh, social distancing than people that were within the uh, rural communities. But then, of course, when there's no patronage for the fish, they just have to do with what they have. So I think both ways in both the rural and the metropolitan uh, uh, both set uh, both uh, people, both set of people were affected and it affected the sustainability uh, flow of food they rather into the in the households. So it's been it's been uh, very difficult for most households, if, apart from the fish fish and households, non fish households have also suffered similarly. So uh, they've had to cut down to ration and the number of meals they take per day. Uh, uh, thank you, Kafiat. Um, Eddie Trudeth, you started to talk on nutrition and and food security earlier. Can you elaborate on that? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, again, on the Tanzanian perspective, as I said, we didn't have, uh, you know, hard lockdown, and therefore um, activities have been happening as normal, um, despite some fears within individuals and among people that there is this COVID and precautions need to be um, observed. Um, and uh, as of now, there hasn't been an assessment to assess the before and at the now when uh, uh, COVID-19 is there. So I may not really say distinguish between the pre and during the COVID-19. However, again, the thing is that the information I have is the domestic market of fish has been strengthened. And what does this mean? It means that people domestically have more access to, to fish, which means that with the role that fish plays in uh, providing for nutrition and food security, that is significant because now uh, with what we have in the country of having eight point something percent um, uh, eating fish per, per year, it would increase when the assessment will, will be done. So this I think is significant. Um, so in terms of uh, how it affects food secure household food security, uh, again, uh, with the what Kafayat has said, food security is linked to access to income, access to cash. So with the disruption that has happened, it means it has also disrupted the cash flow within the families, within the fishers and fish workers, especially women uh, who are um, key players in the short supply chains. So how would they feed their families if they are interrupted? So this is what I would say how it has affected um, the household um, security. Uh, uh, thank you, Edith Trudeth. Um, Kafayat, I think there are some <laughs> photo bombing in the background. I think that what we need to acknowledge that we are mothers, we are also have our families at home with mm -hmm. us and our children at home with us, and that is absolutely um, a part of our lives. Let's not pretend that it is not there. So what I'm going to kind of um, uh, uh, do now is I'm going to play a clip from back from the seminar, uh, the webinar we had. And we are going to um, uh, just play a clip from Charles America where he basically goes into the issues around the market. And I think it, it covers some of the questions that, that we have. After that, um, uh, Eddie Trudeth and, and Kafayat, I want you to think about what, what, what are the organizational uh, um, roles. What is your role within your organization and what is the role for, for civil society, civil movements? I know, Kafiat, you also work with civil society and civil movement. What is the role? You are, you are leading us into, into the kind of that, that we're all saying that there's, there are new opportunities. There are more food for 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 local people um if if there are no exports so so let's let's try to kind of talk around a bit about the market but also the role of of civil society uh um but for now i'm just going to play the clip from from charles and take this um thingy off um unmute thank you uh, only my industry cannot afford the fish that was um, generally should have been available to traditionally available to me. Had it been that everybody could catch the fish, it's open for, for fishermen to catch. But because of restrictions there as well, but it is the bigger companies, the bigger, uh, uh, you know, influential companies that can purchase this because they've got the capacity, they've got everything uh, to their disposal to do so. Uh, thank you, uh, Charles. Um, Nasif, there is a question around um, organizing. Um, and uh, um, Essie, uh, it's a question from Mu K. Um, uh, what has the engagement been with government to target programs specifically for women in fishing and coastal communities? 
for example, the DWSWRC as a program, uh, Women in Water Empowerment Program. So um, I'm going to give you a chance as part of the organization, but also Rowena um, as ACAD Frach Wokan Baanwood. Can you keep it short, please? Nasif, you can start. And, uh, historically and always, even today, fisheries is seen as the child of agriculture. So when the president put in a, I don't know how many billions of, of, of rand and cash into agriculture, but all of that goes into into institutional arrangements and set up for, for farming. In fishing, that kind of recognition is not given. So, it, so what it means is that the the role that women play is not recognised and, importantly, not supported in the current period. Because women in fish in small scale fishing, as as Rowena uh, said earlier, particularly play a role in the post harvest processes, and it is in the post harvest processes where the regulations becomes more restraining altogether and there is no effort no contribution to be able to alleviate that or to make it easier or to support it and 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 and, and then change it altogether so government is simply at the moment during COVID has no regulate provides no regulatory support for for women in the in in the post harvest processes um, okay, so um, uh, I think I don't know if I can say that I don't know if I can Okay, so um, uh, 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 it's just uh, the the position on the clip is is um, is taking us a little bit backward, but um, uh, you would definitely have a chance to to see that. I actually wanted to to move to um, a way where Charles is basically um, explaining the challenges within within the market. So if we can go to that one at. Um, then, then we can we can start with that. I will also see if there are any other comments and questions from from um, uh, 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 on the on the chat that we can pull in around um, around COVID. I see that we have issues around um, Nigeria contributed to not being able to access support as poor organizational structures, scattered operational base, poor recognition of roles and contribution. And I think that that is uh, the particularly the issue. Let's let's just uh, let's just um, continue the conversation. Um, Eddie Trudeth, let's let's go into organizational um, issues. Let's let's deal with the issue of. Um, uh, poor organizational structure, uh, scattered operational base, recognition of roles and contribution. I mean, the, the issue of on the continent is definitely an issue of um, to what extent are you are we able to uh, to to organize, to mobilize, to advocate um, uh, small scale fisheries, uh, social movements in the in, in on the continent ha has been been weakened and also at at times depending on the country strengthened but also with challenges what is your perspective on that yeah thank you moniba um yes i agree that um there has been some challenges in there and that's why for me i've been so much advocating on creating an enabling environment for the fishers and fish workers to get organized meaning that they need support for them to be able to organize themselves and advocate for the issues that are of their concern. And through such kind of organizations, they will be able to secure uh, you know, a seat in the decision-making tables and make their voices heard. 
And I want to give some um, action-oriented kind of examples. Um, uh, in, in Tanzania, for example, uh, what has been said and we have been hearing uh, now and then about the role and place of women in the small-scale fisheries, how uh, they are not recognized, how they are not valued and all those. For me, I'm like saying, now let's stop about agonizing, let's organize and march ahead. So in Tanzania, um, right now we are to, uh, in collaboration with the government, we are implementing the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty alleviation. And this stems from the efforts of civil society organizations towards linking the international processes to the local processes. So my organization, EMEDO, after the adoption of SSF guidelines in Rome, we conducted a national workshop here in Tanzania to raise awareness, but also to bring on board and to seek support of the government towards implementation of this important tool. So what is happening now is that through that process, through um, the use of the key principles, basic human rights principles that call for inclusion, for participation, for engaging particularly women in the different processes, development processes in the whole fisheries value chain, in the supply chain, recognizing their significant contribution, we have been able to support women. I would not say that we have done much, but we are already somewhere. Uh, we have done some kind of mapping to map where are these women along the fisheries value chain? What are they doing? What are the challenges that they are facing? and seeking from them what can be done to improve the situation. And through that, we have been able to, uh, to, to, to support the women. They have formed a national network of women in small scale fisheries, which is called Tanzania Women Fish Workers Association Taufa. So this is very, very important. And I would say for the very first time in Tanzanian history, women from all over Tanzania from all the water bodies, we have three great lakes in Tanzania, Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Nyasa, but also the whole stretch of Indian Ocean, women were represented, and the small water bodies bringing on board the rivers and smaller lakes. They were represented and to form this national consultative process to form this uh, organization. And through that, they have elected, they have their own national leaders, and to which, for the very first time I was saying, they were able to contribute in the reform, in the, in the regulatory reform in the country. In February, the ministry, towards the end of February, the ministry launched the whole process, stakeholders consultative process towards um, uh, reviewing the Fisheries um, Act of, uh, of, of year 2003. And women, I would say, they are not in the picture. So we thought that it cannot be. Women are critical players. Why couldn't they have their voices in that process? So Emedo mobilized the resources and brought all these women together. And a lot of issues were raised to, in, to input in that process. And Thank you very much. Very, very important to listen to the women to what they say and when the laws and policies and the acts contain these issues that are practical that's when they'll be able to be implemented okay thank you very much i think that that the question is also about you know able to access such poor organizational structures scattered operational base and poor recognition of roles and contribution so i value your input in terms of what 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 has been done in your area around women but i think that that doesn't uh, sidestep the issue that we have weakened social movements, um, organization structures to represent um, uh, fishers. And I think more needs to be done to do that. Um, uh, for, 
Kafayat, what is your experience in Nigeria around the, the issues of of um, social movements and organizations um, and 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 uh, as um, as Eddie Trudeth mentioned, you know, getting a seat at the uh, negotiation table, uh, the voluntary guidelines that are important um, uh, international instruments to guide us as to whether human rights violations is being done. But um, are, are they are they organisations that is that 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 are off? what the question is referring to um, in Nigeria? Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, have to, I think I have to speak it from the basis of the official organizations themselves, because these are meant to be community-based organizations, mm -hmm. and they're also supposed to be um, to help um, put some pressure to make uh, to lobby well, on behalf of the official folks. Um, on behalf of the official folks, I know. I discovered that they themselves and do not really value their, their work. They do not know the value the, the value they have. They, they do not have the organizational capabilities to actually fight for their rights. And they are not so much aware of the type of right they have. They do not know what the voluntary guidelines are about. So they lack the information to actually move forward, to actually demand for their rights. And um, uh, I think they need more help from um, social, other social movements that will come in and help them in capacity building. Uh, they, they need uh, capacity building in um, aligning the, the objectives, the, uh, the general objectives of the of the fifth organization to help them to uh, maximize their full potentials. So they need to harmonize themselves first because there are so many of these fish organizations in each state or at the subnational levels and they need to be harmonized and they need to form in, into an apex body. Unfortunately, the experience with them has been that they, they have been subsumed on the other, um, other subsectors, like the aquaculture, the large-scale fisheries. They have been coalesced together, and as such, they are no longer have that identity for themselves to be able to, um, to, to, be able to fight for their own rights, to assert themselves. So, and then, um, but I, I think that the women, my experience has been that the women seem to be much more um, vocal in terms of uh, wanting things to be set or put right in Nigeria. And, uh, but unfortunately, at the at the local government level, at the community level, we are excluded from um, decision making. And as such, uh, I think it's about time there is more like uh, gender inclusiveness in advocacy and decision, and decision making. Then of course they need to strengthen the collective action of the fisher folks. That is one thing that we need, and mm -hmm. I think that, that is where the role of the of the civil societies can actually be of help. They can help with capacity building, for them to be aware of collective guidelines, for them to be educated, for them to have uh, access to information and also training in, in whatever way that can help them to um, in, in, uh, improve their livelihoods. Those are the I think the most. And also see a role, an emerging role for social entrepreneurs. You know, in the whole lot of the um, of the small scale fishery sector, it's about time people take advantage of the informal sector and see a way of uh, of actually making income and as well as uh, helping the small scale fishers as well because they're going they're moving towards a digital economy, and I don't see the uh, capacity of the fisher folks at this stage to actually. Do okay, I th uh, as I th well. so I think. We, if we have people that are interested in social economics, they also take a role. Uh, thank you very much, Kafea. Okay. Okay. I. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Eddie Trudeth, and thank you, Kafayat, for your for your inputs in that. I think it is very important. I think one of the key things is that why we wanted to do this is to kind of raise the profile of women and gender in fisheries. That that is is problematic. I remember there's this one of the articles in um, in in fisheries the, on gender that is is really problematic, and it it is an article around sex for fish. Um, and and uh, that is for me how in many ways uh, gender has been been perceived and and also um, uh, dealt with on um, on on the continent. And we who are researchers and are, are working in fisheries need to demystify that there are um, more fact there are more 
critical issues around um, women and fisheries that goes beyond that particular article that's on the side we are we are now going to kind of we i mean we've been having a lot of fun here hey? and um i didn't realize that the the time is going to go uh, so quickly so we have 20 minutes what i'm going to do i want both of you to start thinking about what what is uh, um i've been on a webinar last week on the i um i is see um the comments we a webinar and and buddy mckay is saying that you know we we we, we mustn't fool ourselves that COVID is going to be here for a long time so we need to kind of think about how we're going to survive and and what are the kind of issues that we need to think about what what were the lessons that we we are doing now and i know that Eddie truth you've been speaking about some of the kind of thing that there's already more food available and is that one of the key pointers that I think is is key now, and the other is um, the issues of how do we imagine um, if if there's going to be a post COVID or we're going to live with COVID like we are living with um, HIV and AIDS. Uh, uh, what what would that be? So if you can just kind of think a bit about that while we go back to a clip and we're going to see what um, Charles America and um, and uh, Nasikh, first Nasikh and then Charles America say about what they think about the post-COVID um, um, inputs. Firstly, I, I said earlier that fisheries is considered or regarded as a stepchild. I think by not considering any support from by, by government is confirmation that even the highest uh, official in the land regards fisheries as as a stepchild, and I and I think he needs to be criticised severely uh, for for that. And I do want to say also that I think that with every crisis comes an opportunity. So it is negative. Our life is bad. Our life is challenging. Our people's lives are difficult right now, more so for small scale sector. But there's a challenge that it provides, and that challenge is is in the human. Spirit. The answer lies in the human spirit of small-scale fishing communities, their resilience, their ability and keenness to organize and to be to build solidarity, interconnectedness across communities. And I think there, therein lies an advantage for what could what could manifest itself in the post-COVID period, that we could have stronger organization, we could have a people agitating or moving towards building and activating organizations that has become dormant. I think all of that has huge potential now. And moreover, I think in what COVID has done is created a social political consciousness amongst the young people. We need to see how we could nurture that in the fishery sector, you know, so that we have young upcoming activists that is newly become conscientized that can play a role and that will they will bring so much energy and so much momentum to the sector that I think you know small scale the small scale fishery sector will just has the potential to swallow up the the fishery. You know, it should be doing that. If it if it's not gonna do it, then I think we are falling short. Thank you, Nasir. Thank you for um, more than thirty seconds. So Charles, I'm going to ask you to um to answer in 30 seconds and charles is also going to tell me no a little bit more um charles is is this an opportunity is it a new form of a new ways of doing things you know sadly that is not my that is not my um, idea or my thinking but what it does do is um we must use this uh, event or this episode or this period to push far more harder and push and pressure government to to um to return fisheries and and, and coastal resources back to its common property uh, uh, status uh, the privatization of, of fisheries strategic uh, privatization of fisheries resources and rights over the decades have left our people very vulnerable and exposed to some of the worst, for example, the COVID. Um, it is on um, the premise of this inequality, this, in, this injustice that we have 
build um, this type of small scale feature that we have. And it is, it's never going to work. It's obviously going to fail as we go forward because if the, the premise, if the basis of, of, of uh, policy and legislation is, is skewed or the, um, in, unequal, the, the end product cannot possibly become equal. So, what we need is we need government to sit down and abandon this privatization policies or this, this, this policy is based on inequality so that we can then come back into the fore and through legal recognition, through re, uh, the, or the, the, uh, you know, the restitution of our rights and also the protection, constitutional protection of those rights, we can then become a, 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 a clear player in all of this, a stakeholder, and our input can then also benefit communities, coastal populations, and it can then also contribute towards a better management of the resources that we are dependent on. But thank you, such thank time, you very much. Um, uh, you know, with us. Thank you, Rowena. Um, uh, can you need some um, in terms of uh, decreases in a certain level? Thank you very much. Um, I uh, please, if you want to see the extended. Um, a webinar it is on the on the website uh, uh plus website i think that um uh, colleagues uh, the the issue of um opportunity that nasi has raised the issue of um the issue of uh, a way of life um that it's definitely in terms of of this, this this can give us press we can press a pause button and we can can think about um uh how how we are doing things and how do we need to rethink um our doing things Edith Rudith, you also mentioned that we have the voluntary guidelines and these are our so social justice tools um but also with the voluntary guidelines we also have the blue economy and the blue economy is a big factor in in um, also when it comes to small scale fisheries. Charles then reminds us that you know it, it's it's about the privatization. Um, it's about the privatization. Uh, I'm just going to mute uh, someone's mic. Um, it's about the privatization is about the injustices and it's about also restitution and i think that we we need to kind of look at all of these things how do we find the balance then also a large part of this uh um webinar was also around um around gender you know what's the role of women and how how are women portrayed and 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 their needs so Eddie truth if you can 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 kind of give me a summary around how do you see a a, a, a surviving and also looking at at um, at COVID in in terms of what we can talk about post COVID it's still debatable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Moniba. Um, a lot has been said of. Uh, how would post-COVID-19 look like? For me, what I would like to emphasize is that um, despite being associated by a lot of challenges, COVID-19 also brings opportunities in a way that it has been able to demonstrate how the local markets can work, how the local markets are efficient. So I think that the local and territorial markets and their distribution systems are much more resilient and efficient than the long uh, industrial chains. And therefore, I think post COVID-19, it would provide an op opportunity for the government and other actors to rethink and to see how they can support and to strengthen the local economies. So I think this is important, and this is the message that I would want. Uh, I would like to leave uh, with this um, with this uh, webinar. And another thing, as I've been saying in several occasions, supporting the small scale fishers and fish workers to organize and support their organization because organizing is one thing, but after being organized, taking 
activities towards realizing their objectives, their vision, and improving the overall livelihoods of the fishers and fish workers is key. It's very important. So this is the message that I would want to send across. Thank you, Moniba. Uh, uh, thank you, Editor Ed Kafiat. Um, uh, can you give us um, your sense around a post-COVID um, world, or are we just surviving? Oh, oh thank you, Moniba. Um, what I can see is I can I can also express optimism. The optimism I see in the, uh, the from the fish traders, the women especially. They are, they are very depressed of the brunt of the COVID-19. Uh, even they're making losses, they're not making profit. We'll bounce back to uh, normal. And not income from the livelihoods of the issue here. Now, but then, uh, uh, I think what is fundamental is that we must recognize that this is a time for the call for fisheries uh, reforms, reforms in the fishery sector uh, at the global level. With the, with the recent EPS IAA study, um, I hope that this will help to, uh, to, to propel um, in, um, action on the part of the teachers and part of the CSOs and on the part of the development agencies as well for better funding for the fishery sector. And then um, I think the government has to, as a necessity, has to improve the quality of life in the fisheries, the fishing communities. That is fundamental. That is, that is we're helping them to build resilience so that we, if, uh, if there's any other pandemic or any other disaster that comes along, they will have the fortitude to withstand such stress. And then they can also help by producing, uh, by actually rolling out some safety nets, such as by uh, establishing buyback schemes um, to mop up fish for later sales from the fishers, uh, to introduce seafood in the institutional feeding programs. You know, they could also help create the safety net in forms of grant insurance schemes, specifically for the more targeted towards the women. And of course, there has to be a continuity in, um, in community organizations. And because of that continuity, apart from gender inclusiveness, they must also stimulate the youth because a lot of teachers are discouraging the children from taking up the profession. So there must be a way of engaging the youth in decision making and being part of the uh, of the whole of the whole setup in the committees in the, to be uh, to help with information sharing, uh, awareness campaign and the likes, and advocacy as well. So and then, as I said, in my country we need a reform, and I'm, at, at this point I'm also calling. Uh, for the establishment of the Fisheries Commission and, um, and also uh, an inclusive of the co governance policy because we, uh, we operate a centralized uh, fisheries management system. And I'm also calling for coming to the ecosystem approach to fisheries management. I feel that when these are in place and when there is more of interactive governance, most of the challenges of the fishers, of the fisher folk, will be solved, um, all, practically all will solved because these uh, challenges have existed before the COVID-19 and will now only become aggravated as a result of the, uh, of, of the pandemic you know, because of the measures taken to actually halt the pandemic. So I'm positive that things will rebound, but then it must also depend on the direction we choose to take. That is, the reforms have to uh, be done now. And then I think in the next two years, they're going to have a the year of the artisanal fishermen of uh, artisanal fisheries. So I think that one will help perhaps to increase the tempo for reforms and also for better livelihood for the fisher groups. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think that that is that is important. I um, I think that we have different perspectives around. Um, if I look at what Nasir 
perspective is um, um, resonates with with Eddie Trudeth and also with um, with Kafayat, but I also sense that uh, Charles America, who is a Fisher, is a little bit more pessimistic. If we are not going to deal with the issues of the injustices, if we are not going to deal with the issues of privatization, um, we we are not recognizing the rights of of people. Kafayat, you're also speaking about reform. How do we how do we need to reform? Uh, the fisheries policies. Um, Africa, 90% of Africa's fisheries is small-scale fisher. But I feel that the focus of the African Union, I feel the focus of government is a blue economy, it is large-scale aquaculture, and not necessarily investment in small-scale fisheries, let alone investment in organizing small-scale fisheries and 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 in, in terms of the voice of small-scale fisheries. So I think it is very important that that these these are uh, um, um, uh, things need to be in place. For me, um, I think what I, how I would like to wrap up in the next few minutes is that today it's the 8th of uh, June and it's World Ocean Day. What would be your final message in terms of, of World Oceans Day? Um, Eddie Trudeth, Kafiat, and, and that would also be your, your final, your final uh, thoughts. We've got a few minutes. Eddie Trudeth? Unmute, please. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. As um, being a World Oceans Day today, I'm reminded of the theme of this year, which says innovation for a sustainable ocean. Innovation, what does it mean? for the small scale fisheries. This is important. So I would like to say that small scale fishers are important. They are the innovators. They are the private sector. They are the professors in these areas. So there is no sustainability in the whole ocean development processes without small scale fishers and fish workers, particularly women, to be part of these processes. They are part of the innovation and therefore they should be part of all these processes relating to the introduction of new methods, ideas, products, and the whole the, the dynamism in the whole process of um, um, you know, ocean sustainability. Thank you, um, Edith Trudeth. Um, Kafayat, what would be your ocean message today? Well, my ocean message is this. I recognize that the blue economy, the blue growth, is more of this, what is uh, the current thing now. But then, there hasn't been any specific um, mention of how the small scale issue fits in into the whole uh, the blue economy. So I, I would like to say that there has to be a place for the small scale issues in the blue economy, and because they are fundamental to the survival, to the livelihood, the food security of millions of people world, I mean, all over the globe. So for me, if there is no space for the small state issue, then definitely what we think is a blue economy might not actually be sustainable. Uh, 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 yes, thank you very much. My message for World Ocean Day is that I'm reminded by Charles America about the injustices. I'm uh, reminded in terms of, I agree with you, uh, Edith Rudeth, that um, uh, Charles America was the first person I interviewed when I was a young student um, over 25, almost 30 years ago when I started doing my work. And I was so impressed with, with, with the knowledge that he has. So let's not think that fishermen do not know how, how these, um, impact them. I think it is important that we move towards the artisanal year of the fishers. I think it's very important that we tackle the issues of, of the blue economy and we are linking the blue justice to blue economy 
and bringing in the voluntary guidelines, bringing in the gender, bringing in the principles that, but also dealing with the privatization of, um, of, of the oceans. I also want to add, let's, let's not think that innovation is going to be uh, let's not celebrate innovation in such a way that it that it's also part of excluding small-scale fisheries let's let it be included thank you very much i would also want to say that um thank you to to eddie Trudeau for you for getting up very early uh for kafayat for you who are um about to you need to sleep in houston she's not from nigeria so the internet connection from her side please do not think that it's from nigeria i think nigeria has faster internet it's houston's internet um, I would like to thank um, Too Big to Ignore Global for 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 having um, uh, presented us and giving us the opportunity to to have this webinar. And I hope there's an exciting lineup today. And I will see you later in the Blue Justice session. So I think there's no sleeping for us today in terms of World Oceans Day. It's just a, a new, um, the sun has just rised in Cape Town. So um, uh, Ratana, please go sleep. <laughs> I think it's time for you to go sleep and um and we will think. thank you very much for um for all of your 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 input and your time in pulling this off and all those who have tuned in thank you very much I know it's early for the continent but this will be recorded and you can also watch it later and send send it further thank you bye bye um thank you all <laughs>